It's a good thing that Phil's not here, because I, I, I just got to get some stuff off my chest. Sometimes the guy just gets on my nerves. I don't know if, you know, sometimes it's just his attitude, and, and uh, he just seems like he, he knows everything, and he just does everything right. And he's right behind me, isn't he? <sighs> Love you, Phil. And that rap on his car, he thinks he's just... <laughs> We'll come back to that, but let's, uh, um, let's read the text. Uh, thank you. Yeah. All right. Mark, uh, oh, I guess I did leave that slide in there. It's so weird. Sometimes you think you get rid of stuff and then it comes back. That's fine. Um, this is uh, Mark chapter 13, and if you guys want to turn in your Bibles, I would encourage you to do so because uh, we're going to look at this as the first two slides, and then um, we'll be referencing it throughout the sermon. Oh, thank you. We'll be referencing it throughout the sermon, and uh, uh, there we go. Okay, there we go. There we go. All right. Mark 13, verse 14. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand that those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one who is on the housetop must not go down or go in to get anything out of his house, and the one who is in the field must not turn back to get his coat. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that it may not happen in winter. For those days will be a time of tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation, which God created until now and never will. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then, if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or Behold, there, do not believe. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But take heed, behold, I have told you everything in advance. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this is your word. And Lord, uh, the time of your people is, is valuable, God, and you've given us this opportunity to worship you together. Give us understanding, Lord. You have told us to understand, God, not to come to this and, uh, and wave it off, not to come to this and, and treat it as somebody else's problem, Lord, but to understand what you have for us. And so, Lord, I need your Holy Spirit right now to anoint my lips and to give me supernatural power beyond myself. God, that, uh, um, that the things that we say today, the things that we share, would be honoring and pleasing in your sight, Lord Jesus, that uh, um, feed your sheep in Christ's name. Oh, that was good. Very, very close. Sorry. Sorry, Tom. Okay. Thank you. There we go. Is that good? We're good? Let me get this out of... Uh, me hitting it with my knee range. I'm doing everything wrong. Tom's probably just dying back there watching me. All right. So, the abomination of desolation. Let me read to you. This is uh, prayed. All right. What causes you to move your feet? The disciples listening to Jesus held a particular interest in the signs and wonders that Jesus spoke about after receiving warning that no stone of the temple would not be thrown down. It's been a month since I last talked about the temple, and I imagine there are some new faces or old faces with new memories that need to be reminded of what a central place the temple held in the life of the Jews at the time. Next year in Jerusalem has been a repeated phrase at Passover for, mill for millennia, even and perhaps certainly so with the Jews in diaspora since shortly after the time of Christ. The phrase and the longing to be in the city together, and particularly in and around the temple, existed long before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Before Christ, it existed in the Jews of captivity, as evidenced by Daniel praying with his windows open in the direction of Jerusalem when he was found by his enemies. And I'll bring up that passage here. Jerusalem, the heart of the Jewish culture. So even in the Old Testament, there's evidence that the Jews who were somewhere else, were longing for Jerusalem. They were longing for the temple. I can't understate how important that was to their culture. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, 
he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. I can't put my hand in my pocket. There we go. Will that work? Sorry. Keep my hands free. Um, then these men came by agreement and found Daniel, making petition and supplication before his God. Elsewhere in the Psalms, there's one of the Psalms that's written, Lord, if I forget Jerusalem, if I don't count it my highest, highest joy, let my right hand forget its skill. The idea that, Lord, if, if, if I forget Jerusalem, nothing else I produce in my life matters. So this is core to the identity. And so it's not only, it's not only the city, it's not only that place, but what is central to Jerusalem. So the heart of the Jewish people is Jerusalem. The heart of Jerusalem is the temple. And you know this, the heart of the temple is the, the altar, the Holy of Holies, because that is the place, the mercy seat, that represents the very presence of God with his people. So this is our foundation. And this is, in the, in the last sermon, I mentioned how it was, it was such a shock to the disciples when they had made this proclamation, Lord, look at these stones, talking about the stones around the temple, of Herod's temple, how great stones these are. And Jesus told them, I tell you the truth, not one of them is going to be left on another. He was basically telling them their hearts were going to be ripped out, that the center of their culture was going to be completely desecrated. This was a massive shock to the disciples. And so that sets the tone for everything we see in Mark chapter 13. I mentioned previously that the temple was not only the center of worship and the place where tribes would gather, but also a place where money was exchanged and stored. It was, it was a bank. As Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that was certainly the case for the Jewish people. I don't think it's a far cry for us to surmise that the annual festival, the Passover, uh, because it was supposed to, the requirement was, of course, for the men to appear, but it wound up being men and families, etc., was a good time for meeting other families and arranging marriages. This was a big deal. You show up for Passover, this is where we find ourselves. We see the tribe. The, oh, man, all the tribes are here, the people from the different parts of the country, and, uh, and the family of Israel is gathered together at Jerusalem. And so it is that Jesus shocked the disciples with the knowledge that it would be destroyed. And not only that, but as we saw in the beginning verses of Mark 13, that there would be wars and disasters, the followers of Christ would testify before the powers of the world, whether that be the religious powers, the synagogues, or the governmental powers. The gospel would be preached in all the earth, and the disciples would be, prayed to, would be betrayed to death. That was what we dwelt on before. It was the idea that even their family members would turn them over, thinking that they were doing a service to God, thinking that they were doing the right thing. We need to get rid of this. And we saw this in the days of Saul that he thought he was doing God's work by rooting out Christians and turning them over to the authorities. And after those things, we arrive at the peculiar warning about the abomination of desolation. Matthew's gospel, traditionally regarded as being addressed to the Jews in its presentation, has a parallel to this. This section of scripture is often called the Olivet Discourse. Jesus gave this on the Mount of Olives to the disciples although he repeats some of these warnings in Luke's gospel when the Pharisees question him about it. In the Olivet Discourse, and as the clarifier, as spoken through the prophet Daniel, which would have been a particular note to the Jewish audience, it was not far back in Jewish history, and they had a much stronger grasp, for history, grasp on history than most of us, that Antiochus IV, otherwise known as Antiochus Epiphanes, a king of the Seleucid Empire um, set up an idol of Zeus and offered sacrifices to it in the Holy of Holies, the heart of Jewish culture. This took place in AD or BC, 167 BC. So a handful of generations before this generation was the absolute worst atrocity that the Jews had ever witnessed. They were in security. They were in a, in a place of, uh, um, they had gone into captivity, in and out of captivity, but for Antiochus to do what he did, to desecrate the temple in that way, not only with the pig's blood, but with the idol of Zeus in the temple, um, it was unconscionable to the Jewish minds. And it was incredible to them that the fire of God didn't come and consume the nation. 
it was most certainly regarded by them as a departure of the glory of God from the temple, that the glory had, had left, that whatever quality of the Jewish people, Israel's name means that he wrestled with God, that they basically regarded as God said, I'm done. And it led into the Maccabean period, which is not a, a it's an extra biblical text um, and has some rather fantastical things in there. But if you look into the, the historical incredible accounts, it was an extremely terrible time in Israel. And so this idea, this picture, when, uh, when the disciples heard the abomination of desolation, there was no ambiguity to it. This was not a metaphor. This was, this was not anything nebulous to them. They knew... Okay, Jesus, what are you talking about? We, we dealt with that in, 80, or in 167, you know, for them 160 years ago. We, we saw this, but Jesus is warning, you're going to see this again. It is here that we need to note that there are two major views of the interpretation of the Olivet Discourse and many opinions between them. There are those that are regarded as preterists, those that have uh, seen that all of these things have already been fulfilled. Now, I'll explain that. For some of you, maybe, what? That doesn't make any sense. And, uh, and yet, there are strong challenges to the idea that everything that Jesus is warning about here is set in the future. And so I'm going to present both of these um, views a little bit today. Uh, in one camp, it is seen that the strong language of Jesus, tribulation, such as n- has not occurred since the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will, as well as astronomical signs, and even the notice that the readers are warned of what they see in the temple while out in the field, an appeal to capabilities not present in Jesus' day outside of the miraculous, suggests that most or all of the message in question is concerning events that we modern believers have not witnessed. So the text when it says, the one who's in Judea out in the field, don't go back to your house to get anything. Well, why would the person that's working out in the field... um, be able to see what's going on in the temple. Well, outside of the miraculous, we would make the case today that, well, that, that's not possible. And yet, anybody and everybody has a phone, a combination tracking device slash video machine that, uh, that they take with them everywhere. They would be able to see what's going on. And so there's a strong appeal to modern technology that says, no, what Christ is talking about is set far in the future from the disciples. In the other camp, The fulfillment of many of the warnings, such as the betrayal that Christians would face, wars and famines, the behavior of Christians, and even signs and wonders surrounding the siege of Jerusalem, recorded by Josephus, lend credence to the view that most or all of these events occurred at the time of the rebellion and siege of Jerusalem, completed by the destruction of the temple. A verse of particular division on the topic is Mark 13.30. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. While we reference these differences today, I aim to bring them more to the foreground with a Last Day Survival Guide Part 3 next time I'm invited to, uh, to speak on this topic. Um, but the short version, this generation, every other time it's used in the Greek in the New Testament refers to what we would typically refer to as, you know, like a 30 to 40 year period, a a generation of of people. There is that particular Greek word is not used necessarily like others that deal with an epic or a a broad age, the age of the Gentiles, which is a phrase that uh, um, I can't remember if it's in the the letters or if Jesus uses it elsewhere. And so um, there's strong arguments to be made in both cases. And while I'll address those In this sermon, um, it's not my aim to uh, definitively put a foot down in either one today, and it's not uh, because I'm trying to shy away from the controversy, um, but it's simply because I think there are uh, some broader takeaways for us today in the the scripture that we've read. In practice as well in conversation, nothing was detested among the Jews as much as a pig. While we may enjoy the flavors and protein benefits today, there is no getting around the reality that pigs are not known for their clean behavior or discerning diet. To say someone eats like a pig is not a compliment. More strongly, though, than the revulsion of Jews towards pigs, as they honored God, was their revulsion to idolatry, at least as it regarded the temple. At least as it regarded the temple. And hold on to this for a second. This is a critical distinction. 
because numerous times in the Old Testament we have records of the theft of idols, don't we? Accounts of everyone from Rachel stealing her father Laban's household idols, Aaron and the golden calf, to the people who worshipped the ephod that Gideon made, to the Asherah poles in high places ever present since the taking of Canaan. The Old Testament is littered with accounts of the people of God violating his commands to run after images that could never deliver and instead brought damnation. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they can't smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them. And so will everyone who trusts in them. We become what we worship. What do you watch? What do you follow? What, what do you put as an authority in your life? You're going to adopt those behaviors unto yourself. We have the behaviors of our parents, we have genetically, you know, I can see behaviors inside of Simeon that, uh, you know, that, that are clearly things that I don't remember demonstrating to him or doing in front of him. Like, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a sinful attitude, but I've seen him, you know, hit himself in the head when he's frustrated. Thankfully, he's starting to come out of that. and had to actually discipline a little bit about, no, you are not going to, you know, hit your head into the floor when you're frustrated or something like that. And, uh, um, but I've never done that at the house, I don't think. Have I done that? No. And, uh, and yet, in the past, I know that that's kind of stuff that I've done. I get mad at myself. I, I hit myself sometimes, or used to when I was a kid. I hit my head on my desk or something if I was frustrated. So I see my tendencies in my child. But more so than that, in daily practice, those that we watch, those that we follow, those that are influencing us, guess what? They're going to influence us. And so as... The people of God went after idols as they went after these lifeless things. Guess what? They became more and more lifeless, more and more deaf, more and more dumb. And what do we see in our sinful and fleshly nature? A world that keeps getting more and more deaf and more and more dumb with every passing hour. So it is on the one hand that the covenant people of God while they would hold Jerusalem in high regard. The temple, hey, we're going up to the temple. Boy, howdy, it's a Passover. We're going to see everybody. We're going to worship God. This will be a wonderful time. They would often fall into chasing after their own less lusts on their home turf. Do we need any mirrors right now? While the passages are not expressly didactic, meaning teaching, or intended to instruct behavior, as are the commandments and other passages of Scripture warning against idolatry, they are very instructive by way of example. Do we have idols in our homes? Do we have idols in our hearts? We may have the places where we go and worship God, but when it comes to, oh, I'm, I'm 50 miles from the temple, I'm 100 miles from the temple, and God's not right here. He's in Jerusalem, so I'm, I, you know, I need something here. They're instructed by way of example. We make a pretense of following instructions. We like to think that we are listening to the best sources and doing the very best we can to follow expert advice, whether that be about our relationships, our money, or health. Falling into rhythms, we often accuse in our spiritual practice as being legalism. We do that a lot, don't we? Somebody tells you spiritually, hey, you know, you should avoid that, or uh, this isn't good for you. That's legalism. And yet, have any of you clicked internet links that say, follow this one trick? Ten rules you should follow. Oh boy, give me those. I'm sure I'll become whatever, more successful, more attractive, anything like that. You've seen the clickbait. We are geared towards these behaviors. We want a list and we convince ourselves that, that we're listening to experts, that we're listening to intelligent sources. Yet when we realize that financial trends shift with the winds, and our medical experts change their opinions seemingly endlessly over the course of a year, 
we find ourselves falling back into testimonies and unanswered questions. How did that person get money? Where did they find that? Did this individual get the shot or not? Was a ventilator involved? These are all things, I would guess, come upon your mind as they have mine. Serious questions that we may or may not ask. But when we look at ourselves and we examine ourselves, it doesn't matter what our data source is or wherever we're getting these, this information, we want to know from the mouth of someone we trust what actually happened. Examples matter. It's reality. The reason is we want examples. We are not content to build our lives on abstractions. We are not content to build our lives on abstractions. Now, God does this miraculously on the authority of Scripture, so I'm not um, intending to come against uh, single pastors that are by the grace of God or ministering in His Spirit. So, brother, if you're listening to this, um, whichever brother hears this message, if you're a single pastor, if you ever listen to this, you're doing this by the work of God and you understand it. But for most of you that are married, are you going to go to a marriage counselor that's single? No, that's, that's a silly idea. You want examples. You want concrete. Now, in Scripture, we have a command. Come out from among them. In 1 Corinthians 6. And multiple Scriptures showing us examples of this carried out. Noah and his family separated themselves from the absolute destruction of the flood. Lot and his family were called out of Sodom and Gomorrah before fire consumed those cities. The congregation of Israel was called to step away from the camp of Korah, and the earth swallowed up the whole company in rebellion. God will not be mocked, and his judgment is sure. The question is, will you lash your desire to the perishing fancies of this world, or trust the promises of Christ? The Jews understood the horror of the abomination of desolation, idolatry in the most holy place, and would have realized it as a sign that the judgment of God was about to fall. In this context, the following verses, the verses after that in Mark 14, make perfect sense. Don't get anything in your house. Don't go get your coat. The account in Numbers is extremely strong. Korah and his followers had, had risen up against Moses. Who said you were the one to be over us? Moses, you speak for God. You don't speak for God. Any of us. Come on, we're the people of God. Why can't one of us? And they even had a special place. They had been selected to help with the transport of the temple. They were a special people. But when they rebelled against Moses, Moses had to fall on his face because God said to Moses, I'm going to consume this congregation. Moses interceded along with Aaron. They fell on their faces before God. God, you brought this people up. Don't bring this judgment on all of them. And God said, all right. And so God instructed Moses and Aaron to tell the people, tell the congregation, step away from Korah and his family. And the earth opened up and swallowed them all. The command of God was for them to come out because the wrath of God was sure to come upon that congregation. And the earth swallowed him up, and God has never done anything quite like that since, and never had before. So, the idea that this warning to the disciples, in this context of the abomination of desolation, okay, yeah, I get what you're saying, Jesus. Wait, don't I need to go down into the house, get something maybe? I might be out on the road for a while. These seem like simple ideas, even... In the event of a fire, you may have a list of must-haves that you are willing to venture a little risk for. In this instant, and in the moment that the message is perceived by the hearers, sorry, my nose is really itchy, they must realize that there is no time for must-haves, certainly not the must-haves of the earth. Christian, what must you have? What must you have? What are you called to have? The only source of your life. What's that? Christ. Well, I want to hear that from some more voices. The only source of your life is Christ. 
Christ. And so when our Lord tells us, don't even go into your house, this is, uh, um, I don't fault uh, the, the, uh, the preppers in regards to just dealing with the, the times and the seasons of the earth. Because frankly, compared to previous generations, we are extremely dependent on a complicated network of, uh, of resupply. And so most of us don't have a whole lot in our fridge or our larder, as the old term used to be. And uh, it's not unholy or impractical for us to think, okay, yeah, maybe I should uh, um, have a little bit stored up like our forefathers did. That's not unwise. But the... Um, but in this command, you know, some of you have heard the term of, oh, I got to have my go bag. I got to have this. Jesus is saying, don't get your go bag. <laughs> Jesus is saying, bail, because the Lord is our provision. There's a picture in the background, if you notice the whole time, but it's, it's these wilderness places. It's this, uh, uh, the idea that God had called out the people from Jerusalem and Judea, the, uh, thank you, Janice, the place of their comfort into the desert. Because that's where they're going to find relief. They're not going to find it in... Thank you, thank you. Very itchy. Sorry, everybody. They're not going to find it in Jerusalem or Judea. That is not going to be the place of their security. And so, it is proved that the true faith and devotion of the believer, Christ's words have final authority. And Jesus has demonstrated his love to us time and time and time again. So do not second guess. Jesus wants us to understand these texts very clearly. Prayer is encouraged about nursing in the season of winter. Don't woe to those who are pregnant nursing in those days. It seems to have some bearing that even in these events of which God is planning into the future, that the prayers of the saints carry weight. We should touch on the interpretation that these events have already happened in Israel for a moment here. Snow is not unheard of in Israel in winter. And again, there's a passage where, it, where we're reading through the text where he's specifically speaking about Judea. The word is Judea. Now, we could, we could make that a, a, a figurative sense in the, as in those who are not in Jerusalem, but those who are in the broader area. But his word is Judea. And uh, um, so hold with me on the, not, on the already happened interpretation for a second. Additionally, due to the famines in and around the city of Jerusalem due to the siege, there are records to indicate that the people opted for cannibalism. Now, I mentioned the siege of Jerusalem in uh, last sermon. It was a terrible time. Josephus' records is, are based on him being a liaison between the Roman generals and the leaders of Jerusalem at the time. And, uh, and so he was seeing, he was witnessing firsthand the deprivations of the city of Jerusalem. And we are left with the impression that Josephus' concern in trying to negotiate a surrender was not because he wanted the Romans to win, but because he didn't want Jerusalem to suffer anymore. He just couldn't take it. He was seeing people, you know, turning on each other. This was a wicked, wicked generation that Josephus writes about. It was not a kind time to pregnant and nursing mothers. And while the temple was burning, there is good historical evidence to support that Roman general Titus sacrificed a pig on the temple grounds. And, uh, um, and it, is, it is Josephus, but there's other writings that write of that legion. There are a lot of historical records of the, of the Roman companies at that time. Not only did they sacrifice a pig, um, but one of the internet sites I was looking at this um, had a uh, reference to one of that legion's standards or the flags that they carry in a battle, the pig on it. This is heinous. This is, this is extremely offensive. This would have been regarded as an abomination. Church historian Eusebius also gives an account that the church in Jerusalem had received a prophetic oracle and already fled the city. In this regard, obedience to the warnings of Jesus led not only to the preservation of the church, but also the dispersal of the gospel. And as an aside here really quick, the, uh, I'm, as the, ever the compromiser, I kind of have my feet somewhat in both camps. And I'll explain why, because there are a lot of uh, theologically minded people that are like, wait, how can you be both? You can't do both. Um, on the one hand, either it, it happened that Jesus was saying, these are the tribulation that, that's going to come. It was terrible. It already happened or, it, or it's coming. You can't do both. Well, in, in a sense, I would put to you that this is a type of the things to come. That's my current idea. This is a type of the things to come. We have a lot of biblical examples of types of things to come, don't we? 
the temple was a representation and the, and the animal sacrifices all pointed to Christ, right? The rock in the desert from which the water came forth, it was a type of Christ. Joseph, in his captivity, and in all that God used him for, was a type of Christ. Was the account of Joseph true? Absolutely. It wasn't a prophecy, it was a real event. And yet we see that all of these things are pointing to the Messiah, or pointing to the real deal, the big event coming. And, uh, and so I would, my, my current opinion is that the church saw all of these things happening, and they said, you know what, I can't stand near this. The wrath of God is coming. I need to get out. And so they did. And it led to the preservation of church, the church and the dispersal of the gospel. Verse 19 is one of the verses I think puts this into the not yet category. Christ's alert that the tribulation coming is not like anything the earth has ever seen or will see. I haven't found anything yet to suggest that, it de- that this is declared excluding the events of the flood. Verse 20 likewise seems to have global language, which is writing about going to the four corners of the earth and gathering the elect. Um, writing that no flesh would be saved without the shortening of those days of tribulation. We should not ignore the justification for shortening the days for the sake of the elect. God's chosen people are a consistent theme every time heavenly wrath visits the earth, as mentioned earlier. Remember, Lot and his family get out of Sodom and Gomorrah, and what happens? Wrath of God. The company of Israel gets out of the way. Wrath of God. No one and his family get into the ark. Wrath of God. Could it be that while we as believers regard all of these texts about what is coming and what God is promising to come on the world, you know, sometimes we get into a, a, a way of thinking that we're afraid of the world systems, we're afraid of the government. Folks, the government's nothing before God. God, the only reason why these world systems exist and why the world keeps spinning is because God has his people here to glorify him until he comes. The earth is still spinning, and, and this is a crazy thought, but again, the mercy of God. The reason that mankind still draws breath is because God has not gathered in all of his sheep. He is calling his people out. We are not forgotten. We are not abandoned. He is doing all of these things because the time is not yet done. A warning is repeated in verses 21 and 22, similar to verse 6, which is, again, that warning. Many are going to come in my name and say, I am he. Behold, there he is. He is there. Why is this so important? Because at this point, in context of the previous verses of Jesus' warnings to the church, believers have been betrayed by family, many given over to death. They have left their homes to stay in wilderness places. They're living on the provision of the Lord. They have declared by their testimony that nothing in this world will sway them. That there is nothing better than Christ. Praise God right now that we have brothers and sisters in Afghanistan who are doing that. Who have left everything. Who through... They're not going out and preaching on the street corner necessarily. The Taliban's going to their house and, oh, you got a Bible app on your phone? You're a Christian. Bye-bye. They have the chance. They could maybe renounce and turn back, but they're saying, no, Christ is better. Their children are saying, Christ is better. Our brothers and sisters by the family have been butchered, saying Christ is better. Persecuted believers have rounded the bend to the final stretch of the marathon they have been running and giving it everything they have to make it to the finish. There is no time to look back, no time for a drink, Their eyes are fixated on one goal, to please their Savior. The devil knows this, and having thrown all the tricks at the Christian, he is drumming up his best work to appear as an angel of light, as Paul warned in 1 Corinthians 11. He will use the age-old lie, did God really say, to lure us off course? We've heard the stories of earthbound Jesus. We have feasted on his teachings, and sung the songs of his signs and wonders. Why wouldn't he show up in a reasonable format? We joke and we kid, but whether it's the painting of long-haired hippie Jesus, you know, the famous French painting, or or maybe a a more modern haircut Jesus walking in through the back door in a blue and white robe or something like that. What if Jesus showed up in church today? We joke about those things, 
But outside of understanding the scriptures that tell us that Jesus is coming how? You know this. On the clouds. The vast majority of the world will be deceived by the idea that, oh yeah, I know this Jesus. This is the Jesus that, that shows up and, uh, um, you know, he, he heals some people, he kisses some babies, and he's just a really nice and swell guy. When the Christ that we're presented with in Scripture is glowing with a sword coming out of his mouth to consume the wicked, and he is coming for his people, folks, do not be deceived. And this warning is repeated by Christ because he knows that even believers will be tempted by this idea that the nice, sweet, robed Jesus is going to come back just like we saw him before. Oh yeah, I know that one. And if all we had was the other texts, we would think, oh yeah, that, I could see that. That makes sense. I, I get that. Why wouldn't he show up in a recognizable format? Do not be deceived, Christian. For just as the magicians followed the miracles of Moses in the court of Pharaoh, for a time they were able to duplicate the signs and deceive the people. Christians are always, or charlatans, not Christians, charlatans are always second-rate jobs. They have no original material. Because Christ said, many will come in my name and they'll perform even signs and wonders. Broadly speaking, some of the worst religious teachings in the world today are knockoffs. Incomplete pictures of God's word. Islam has great pretense of the cultural stability and legalism of Old Covenant Judaism, but none of the power and assurance of atonement. Hinduism, for all of its strangeness to most Western minds, puts divine spark into everything, almost glimpsing the absolute sustaining power of God in all things, while horrifically seeing him fractured into a billion fallen pieces. In the spirit of the age, we have countless people claiming they are spiritual who listen to nothing but themselves and worship their bellies. Deception is supplied to the world, and men drink it like water into their souls. And so it is, Christian, at the end of your days, whether they be on a hospital bed or at the end of a sword, do not let yourself, do not let yourself be led astray by anyone. Now, you, I'm sure you've seen the scene in the movie, in any movie. There's, it's, it's a well-used trope, maybe in a spy movie or a thriller or something like that. There's usually a woman or a child. Sometimes it's a man or something like that. They're left in a hotel room while the hero is going to go out and do business. And they tell him, don't leave the hotel, don't leave this room, and don't what? Don't answer. Don't talk to anybody. They don't put in the caveat of, except for me, they just understand when they come back. What did Jesus say of his sheep? My sheep hear my, know me and they hear my voice. Folks, it's unmistakable. When we hear the voice of Christ, do not, if there is any doubt in your mind, it's not him. If there is any little lingering doubt, nah, I don't, I got to check, check it. It's not Jesus. Because Jesus is saying here that many deceivers will come. And we see deceivers in the world today. So you got to check. Check, every, check what you read. Check what you consume. Is this the voice of Christ? Is God building this into my life? My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch out of the Father's hand. Christ is reminds, reminds his disciples to heed his words when he has spoken them in advance. He does not want his followers to be ignorant of these things. Friends, so often we come to this, these passages with weak preconceptions and false premonitions. We gloss over some of the teachings as difficult. We'd rather stick to parts of scripture that we know. God in his grace does not want us to leave these things to scholars in ivory towers. These would have been seen by the early church as fundamentally part of making disciples of all nations. As much as Jesus walking on water or the Sermon on the Mount, we also may come, so the idea here, this is the Olivet Discourse. I told you it was mentioned in Matthew's Gospel as well. If God wants to say something for you to hear, he's going to say it, right? What happens if he says it twice? It's really important. It's very important. And so these things are important to the church. 
pay attention and, and catch what God is saying here. This is for us. Let the reader understand is how we started this. You are the reader, which I also think is one of the cases that puts us into the camp of the things to come because it was written to the disciples. Christ spoke this to the disciples, but the writing was to the hearers that would receive the Gospels. And the idea was for them to not gloss over this, but for them to know it and understand it. We also may come with a tendency with these things, to treat these things fearfully. If there is one thing we would be certain of, it's that we live in a very uncertain age in the world's reckoning. None of the events we are witnessing, though, are outside of God's plan. But often we think of these signs and wonders and cataclysms as being of ma- matters of dread to our person. But often we think of these signs, si- oh, let's see, on a certain level, this should be regarded as a function of our position. Where do we find ourselves? On the ride here today, uh, Simeon got to watch a train, so that was kind of fun. We got stopped by the train. Now, there are a billion places for Simeon to be safe, but in that instant, is there a place for us to not be safe? On the tracks. (laughs) That's not a safe place. Folks, the world is on the tracks of the wrath of God. We have, by his grace, been removed from that danger. But the plan is set and the train is coming. At the end of the day, when you lay your head down to rest, are you trusting tomorrow to the world, be it the natural order or governmental systems, or are you trusting yourself wholly to the one who gives you breath and watches you through the night? For those living in Jerusalem in the first century, and for believers at the return of Christ, we are given the opportunity to declare with our separation from the world system that Jesus is better. Do not fear the world system. For just as in all of the judgments God has pronounced and carried out in Scripture, the removal of his people was to protect them from the fire that would certainly consume the wicked. You must understand that in a very real sense, Jesus is declaring the presence of idolatry in the temple in a time of tribulation. But from this example, do we have times and temptations to come out from what it, to come out from what is sure to bring judgment. And so at this point, I want to make a really clear distinction because there is a tendency of, of the liberal scholars to come to biblical text. Oh, this is metaphor. This is, uh, this is meant for you to live your daily life and stuff like that. Get out of here. I don't, I don't want to deal with that because what Christ is saying here, and we're going to talk about this a little bit Wednesday night, dealing with the, the clarity of scripture. Christ is talking about real things. There may be some, some figurative language we'll talk about with the astronomical signs, But he is speaking about things that are sure to happen. But because of those examples, like we talked about earlier, how should we live? What should this do for our hearts today? Have you committed yourself to something that your conviction tells you that you may regret? By way of entertainment, entertaining those in our homes, have you brought into your home Those who through word and deed blaspheme the God of heaven and invite judgment on themselves. Do you not recognize that you yourself are the temple of God? Your Holy Spirit, His Holy Spirit dwells within you. And so in the inner person, in the inner man, who speaks to you? Who has the opportunity? Who has the ear of your heart? What idols are there? Because when I look at myself, and I I see the outworking of of our behavior, not just myself, I mean, I'm I'm enough of a bad example, but we as believers, what do we entertain? What abominations do we set up in our heart? Let's see, come out from among them, knowing with certainty that the abomination of desolation that comes on the world is a near sign of great destruction, such as has never been seen. What is in the holy place? What is in the holy place of your heart? For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. The things that I entertain in my heart, the idols that I set up, the sacrifices to the lust of my eyes and the the, the pride of my mind, those are the things that my neighbor are going to suffer eternally for if if he doesn't repent. 
What have you established in your Holy of Holies? What has been set up in the inner place of your heart? Far too often, under the covering of grace in my thought and inner man, I've harbored thoughts and feelings that are an affront to my Creator, letting idols stand and injury pour out to my brother or sister in the Lord. Where there should be life, I prop the corpse of the old man for no other reason than to dare God to do something, because in my flesh I am wretched. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. What a great Savior we have. We have tested him again and again and again, and still he relents and loves us. We're going to have communion in a minute. Is there anything in your heart that's an idol? Is there anything in your heart that is a also Christ and also this? There's only one person who belongs there in your Holy of Holies. Last slide. Oh, I broke the thing. Could you okay, take us to the next one? This is the follow-on from Psalm 115. If you could click the next one, Ellie, please. Um, or, yeah, we'll stop here for a second. So takeaways, the word of the Lord is sure. Temple's not going to last. Government's not going to last. Heaven and earth are going to get burned up. But the word of the Lord is sure and forever. Do not be found in the place of wickedness. When you see these things taking place, get out. Get out. <laughs> because the judgment of God is coming. Christ will deliver his church. His sheep hear his voice. He knows them, and no one's going to snatch them out. And finally, cleanse the holy place of your heart. Because we have the grace of God at work in us, cleanse the holy place of your heart. Final, if you would please, last one, Ellie. Final slide. This is the follow-on. After comparing the idols... And their lifelessness. O oh, Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O oh, house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, the small together with the great. Father in heaven, what a blessing to know you. What a blessing. God, the world is blind. And, uh, and Lord, just like, I forgot the analogy, just like uh, Phil was earlier, and we joke about it, God, that, uh, um, that I was mocking him and treating him poorly. Lord Jesus, he was right behind me, and I, I didn't know it. God, the world does the same. The world mocks your name in ignorance. They're dancing on the train tracks of your wrath, and we see the train coming. We see you behind them. We see your wrath coming, and they're our friends. They're our brothers and sisters. Lord Jesus, let us be those on the sides of the tracks, pulling them, yanking them, pleading with them to get out of the way, to look out for the one who is coming. Lord Jesus, we thank you for those that have had the courage, that have had the boldness, to tell us that we need a Savior, to tell us who that Savior is, and to lead us in the paths of righteousness. Oh, what a wonderful love. What a wonderful love you've given us. And in Christ's name, all God's children said, Amen. Amen.